Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean, and together with my co-workers, uh, okay. Max and Jacob, um, we are here from ADATA presenting how to use OpenStreetMap mapping Chinese finance loan projects around the world. So ADATA is a global research um, from the College of Northern Mary Global Research Institute. Uh, we provide policymakers and practitioners and also our partners here about evidence and uh, how sustainable development finance is targeted, monitored, and evaluated. We seek to answer questions, who is funding what, for whom, where, and to what effect. So you see the problem here in the last part, right? Where and to what effect. That's where OpenStreetMap steps in. We incorporated OpenStreetMap into our workflow we developed like a comprehensive geocoding methodology. We geocoded all the different finance projects we're trying to uh, as we can and map the precise geolocation data from OpenStreetMap and include the temporal data we have and generated uh, impact evaluation, such as environmental impact, economic impact, and all the others. So before we dive into deeper on that front, I even give you like a real demo here. Uh, I would like to spend just a little bit more time uh, providing some background information here. So what exactly is development finance? Development finance, you can consider that from donor country flow to receiving country for financial resources, mechanism that help and facilitate the, the development in the receiving countries. And the receiving countries we're talking about here are majorly like lower and middle income countries. And the donor country here, we can categorize them roughly into two big categories. Category number one, traditional donor countries. Examples are United States, Germany, long-time uh, development assistance committee member countries for OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So these countries are reporting to OECD by a very consistent system standard all across the years. So you have really good transparency visuals on how much money being spent, where to what level. Um, there are also non-traditional donor countries, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, China, so they're not DAC member countries. They do not have to report all of those information to OECD. And you can see there, there's an informational gap here. And that's where our research team step in, trying to fill in those informational gaps and provide evidence-based analysis based on that. So just to give you one example, uh, we launched one of our flagship research projects funded by USAID, Hewlett Foundation, et cetera. And uh, we launched it back to 2021 for a 2.0 version of it called a Global Chinese Dome Finance Dataset. So why China? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like China is on the other category, non-traditional donor countries. So we do not have a lot of information uh, publicly available here. So that's where we step in here. And also providing some background information, you probably heard about or not, uh, the, ba the Belt and Road Initiative. So for the first five years, the annual official commitments combining together is like 85 billion US dollar per year. More background information comparing to the United States, uh, it's like a two to one ratio. So throughout our ongoing efforts, ever since uh, the coverage here from 2000 all the way up to 2020, we have 19,000 more projects covered in our data set. And the total amount easily exceed easily of 1 trillion US dollars. And that's across 165 lower and middle income countries in pretty much every major world region. And the projects here, uh, just to give you some example, as small could be like food, uh, book donation to like a rural school uh, in the receiving country, but as major as hydropower plant, power of the whole region, or like a super long railway that across a whole country, ever linking the port to a mining production site. So, Arranging a lot from there and combining the workforce and the workflow with OSM here, we were able to cover the geospatial data of those projects. Um, over 60% of coverage rate for more of uh, recent year data, covering more than 140 countries in the world. So how are we exactly going to do that? So we came up with this kind of uh, methodology, tracking under reported financial flow methodology. We combined more than 100 people team of faculty, staff, student researchers. We were scraping and synthesizing information from a large variety of official sources, majorly, and unofficial sources, kind of filling the informational gap here. 
So official sources are the actual financing documents that we can find signed by the donor and the receiving countries. So you literally can see what's the interest rate there. You can see the signature. You can see all the terms related to that. And we also have um, other reports we use to generate information, such as like report from IMF, World Bank. We also have access to the local media. So you can imagine like local media written in local languages, really covered, covering the stories from the receiving side. So combining all of those information, we have more than like 91 case sources and about like more than 90% of our project records are packed and backed by the uh, official sources. So grabbing all of those information, we are trying to synthesize them according to the OECD's guidelines. So you can see here, the non-traditional donor country and the traditional donor country are now at the same level. OECD guidelines, comparable data set, apple to apple comparison. So with all the information and efforts, we're able to synthesize all of that into more than 70 variables in the data set, ever since the title of the project was the name of it to the description of the project. And the description we're talking here is not just like one or two lines saying what it is, but it ranging from a paragraph to the last time I checked, it's like 3,841 words. So it tells you everything you need to know about the project, like who is exactly the financing agency, who received the money, what is the term between the two entities? And there are also complicated cases when they are forming like a uh, special purpose vehicle and then doing the project and they are like major loan syndicate behind. But we know everything about that. So um, enough uh, and enough those uh, background information, I'm gonna hand over to Max to show you what a real example look like. And we're gonna show you a little demo on the impact evaluation. So over to you, Max. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sean. So what you're looking at right here on the screen is some aerial imagery of a mine in Peru called Las Bambas. This mine provides about 2% of the world's copper supply and on any given year makes up about 1% of Peru's GDP. So it has a huge national and international impact. This mine is one of Aid Data's many projects from around the world and to provide a little bit more background, it began construction in 2012, began operations in 2015, and since then has been operating on and off. I say on and off because there have been a lot of local protests around this site. It's been extremely contentious among locals and the issues are sort of twofold. There's environmental concerns and economic ones. So the environmental concerns are mostly that the Peruvian government is sort of allowing regulations to be put aside um, in exceptional cases for this mine, um, which locals and uh, environmental scientists are concerned will cause extreme harm to obviously local flora and fauna, as well as ecosystems. Additionally, there are eco economic concerns among the locals. So many of the locals believe that the wages they're receiving and the conditions that they're being put under are unfair given the amount of mineral wealth that's being generated at this site. Um, so the reason that we at Aid Data care about this project is because they, the Las Bambas mine is actually owned by a number of Chinese corporations. Additionally, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of Chinese banks invested in the mine and provided it funding to keep it operating. So now that I've sort of given you a little bit of background, you might be wondering, first off, why should I care about this? Second off, how does OSM fit into everything? And third, how do you actually go through the steps of making these projects? And so I'm going to answer those sort of backwards. And the way I like to explain how we form our projects, it's kind of like a mystery. And it starts out with one clue. And that could be some of the examples Sheng was talking about from a financial document, from some major organization or the Chinese government, or even some local media source reporting on Chinese funding for a project. From there, we put together more pieces of information and sort of create a story. And one of the most important pieces of that story is the location of the project. The location really allows us to put it into a broader context and allows you to say, you know, how does this project fit in with maybe other projects in that nation or even in that region of the world? How is China funding in this area? And uh, what does that look like? Additionally, it's the location and the actual actually seeing the geographic size of the project gives you an idea as to the broader context that words sometimes can't. So that is where OpenStreetMap comes in. It allows us to actually map out these locations and show the um, and our final story what these projects look like. Finally, why should you care? All of our projects go to stakeholders and policymakers, just like the one Sheng was talking about, ranging from international organizations to even US governmental organizations such as USAID. And they use our um, stories to make real world decisions. 
And I think that's really incredible that OpenStreetMap, the work that the OpenStreetMap community has done, allows us to inspire and uh, allow these allows these policymakers to make educated decisions um, based off of the information that you are all able to provide. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jacob, and they're going to talk a little bit about some of the analysis that they conducted. Yeah, so we pulled up this example of the Las Famas mine, and I thought it'd be fun to look at some open data and see if we can visualize the development over a period of time during its construction. So hopefully this animation will load here. All right, I think I can do it. So I'll explain what's about to go on. Um, so on the right, we have the open street on base map. You'll probably recognize that. And then um, in that red rectangle is the area of the Las Famas mine project. Um, and that's just south of Cusco there. So you can see that in the top center of the map. And so on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left, hopefully you're going to see an animation of uh, nighttime light emissions in these areas. So starting in 2004, well before the construction, it's going to be very um, dark there. And then during the construction and after once the mine started to be used, um, you'll see very significant light emissions that will be comparable to, to Cusco, at least from our perspective here. Um, so shout out to the Earth Observation Group at Colorado School of Mines for providing this imagery. So hopefully. Yeah, okay. Um, so you can see it sort of growing there. <laughs> I think it started halfway through. Okay, well, uh, we'll have a link to these slides at the end so you can uh, load it up on your computer and see it in better detail. Okay, um, so I want to talk a little bit about our overall workflow, going from the uh, researchers who look at each of these individual development projects all the way to a nice data product that our consumers can take a look at and visualize exactly where these projects are in physical space. Um, so our coders will go in, of course, do all that research on these projects, and they'll generate a list of OpenStreetMap IDs that reference the features that are relevant to these projects, right? So that might be buildings, um, industrial areas. Uh, you all know all these different tags, of course, can be really important to these different localities. And then once we have that all tabulated, we then download those features using the Overpass API. And we use a tool called OSM to GeoJSON to, to, uh, to export uh, individual GeoJSON files per project. And that lets our data consumers decide how much data they want to work with. They can quickly visualize the extent and scope of each of these projects or look at them in mass and see uh, patterns across a large area. All right. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Max to talk a little bit about um, how we interface with OpenStreetMap and find those features and the challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So addition, on top of just using OSM, we also like to try to give back in any way that we can. And so what that looks like for our company um, and organization is oftentimes mapping on map features in very remote and um, developing countries where there aren't many people on the ground to actually map those. So it'll be things like hospitals, schools, and roads and other pieces of information that maybe no one in those areas has taken the time to or has the ability to map. Additionally, in already developed parts of the world where there's a lot of OSM information, what we're able to do is bring the sources and information that we have from all of the background research and apply it to OSM. So update it with more tags, provide more information and more details, such as for our hospital. We might be able to provide the facilities that they offer, how many floors it has, and um, as well, like the individuals who might own the hospital. So that's the sort of information that we are able to provide um, from our team. So we also have some challenges that we face when using OpenStreetMap, as with anything. And the first one, it's not something that I'm complaining about, but it's probably something you're all familiar with. OpenStreetMap is kind of insane how much the community does sometimes, like how detailed some of the places are. It's just like absurd. So for some projects, we have to make decisions, such as for the Las Bambas mine. Do we want to include every single transmission line and every single building in that area and all of the mining pits that individuals have gone and painstakingly mapped out? Would that actually be relevant for the individuals who are consuming our data? As well, we have to determine what sorts of sources we're using in OSM mapping. So our team is made up of about eight undergraduate researchers, none of whom are OpenStreetMap professionals. None of us understand OpenStreetMap perfectly. And when we're working with 50 projects a week and dozens and even hundreds of sources, it can be difficult to determine what actually are we allowed to use while keeping within the OpenStreetMap regulations and rules. And finally, we have to make decisions on what to map and what not to map. So as our projects are becoming more and more current day, as we're approaching even up to the current day, what we're trying, what we're running into is projects will be, we'll know where a project's going to be, but we won't know if something's actually there. And when we're working with older satellite and aerial imagery, it can be difficult to determine whether or not construction has began on a dam or a mine or something else. And so trying to make those decisions to make sure that we don't break any of the OSM guidelines when mapping our locations has been something that we've been struggling with, but also something we are learning to navigate. 
And so with all that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Jacob, and they're going to talk a little bit more about the future of big data. Yeah, so just a little bit of our future plans and how we want to build this out. So right now we have data from 2000 all the way through 2017 available right now for download on our website. Um, and then there's a few more years uh, that we're going to be releasing later this year. So we're really excited about that. Um, and as we think about this workflow, we have so many thousands of OpenStreetMap features that we'd like to track. Um, but of course, those get changed over time. Editors will go in and add new features in those areas or adjust them finally. And we want to make sure our data is updated to reflect that. So we're looking into ideas for automating a process to watch these features and see like how they're changing over time. And we're excited to maybe hear from the community about how that could be done. Uh, and then we also want to think more about how we can contribute back to OpenStreetMap. So we have a lot of researchers who know these areas pretty intimately. They've done a lot of research about these localities. But we haven't often made that next step to go in and add the data, interface with those local communities, and learn about how to map those things properly. And so I, we think we're leaving a lot of contributions on the table, and we're really excited about uh, bridging that gap and hopefully adding more of our data back to OpenStreetMap. So with that, we just want to thank you so much for being here and listening to our talk. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of the researchers who help us out at eData. We have some links to our website and these slides, as well as some of the code that we use to uh, make all of this happen. We're ha happy to answer any questions that you might have after the talk. So thank you all so much. Thank you.